China is a huge country full of important resources and extensive farmlands, a huge population, and an important strategic and commercial position. This made it a desirable objective for expansion to European colonial powers, but also to the rising Japanese Empire. Within China itself, revolutions, civil wars and warlordism plagued the nation, as different factions fought to become the ultimate ruler of the country. So today we return to East Asia to cover the divided state of the Chinese people and the start of the Second Sino-Japanese War. If you agree with us that male hygiene is essential in our day and age, the sponsor of this video, Manscaped, is your best bet. For us, Christmas came early this year because we were gifted the new performance pack by Manscaped. Let's check it out. Manscaped created the world's first all-in-one men's grooming kit that has you covered from head to toe. The Lawn Mower 4.0 waterproof cordless trimmer is built with advanced skin-safe technology, reducing nicks and cuts on your most sensitive areas. Its cool LED light is really helpful for grooming on those winter nights, while Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray are game changers. New to the collection is the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer with 360 degree rotary blades and the same skin safe technology preventing tugging. Manscaped is no longer just for below the waist grooming fellas. In addition to products for your face, they now have you covered head to toe with their new and improved Shears 2.0 Luxury 6 Piece Stainless Steel Nail Kit. You can get all that for yourself and your loved ones and support our channel by buying Manscaped's performance package. For a limited time, you'll also get two free gifts, the shared travel bag and the Manscaped anti-chafing boxer briefs. Don't wait, click our exclusive link in the description to get 20% off, plus free international shipping, plus two free gifts. By the end of the 18th century, the powerful Qing Empire that controlled the vast lands of China was at its zenith, expanding into Central Asia, increasing in population, and becoming the largest economy in the world. But when the 19th century ended, the golden years of the Qing were long gone. Suffering from military weakness, social unrest, foreign interventions, and economic problems, the Chinese Empire had become a sick state in Asia. At the start of the 20th century, as young officers and scholars debated the overthrow of the failing dynasty, a military uprising ended with the proclamation of the Republic of China on January 1, 1912. Dictatorially led by Yuan Shikai, who controlled the modernized Beiyang army, the new Chinese Republic was held in a fragile balance between the nationalists and the republicans. With an iron fist, Yuan managed to keep the country together, but his methods severely antagonized the Kuomintang revolutionaries, eventually dissolving the Nationalist Party and declaring himself Emperor of China in 1915. This attempt caused widespread rebellions in numerous provinces, leading to the establishment of warlord states throughout China after the death of Yuan. Meanwhile, Kuomintang loyalists retreated to the south and established a government led by Sun Yat-sen with the objective of reuniting the fragmented nation. After the end of the Great War, massive popular demonstrations and manifestations occurred against Japanese interests in the country and against the government of the Beiyang warlords, ushering in the creation of the Chinese Communist Party and its alliance with the Kuomintang. As the warlords continued to fight among themselves for the ultimate control of Beijing, Chiang Kai-shek would succeed Sun Yat-sen as leader of the Kuomintang after his death, quickly setting out to prepare for a military campaign against the northern warlords. With the success of the northern expedition, half of China would be under the control of the nationalists by 1927, but Chiang's own purging of communists within the Kuomintang would unexpectedly lead to the creation of the Red Army and the start of the civil war between communists and nationalists. By the end of 1928, Chiang's northern expedition ended in complete success, finally conquering Beijing and bringing the whole of China under the nominal control of the Kuomintang. Although some warlords still ruled in semi-autonomous states, Chiang's government in Nanking received international recognition and legitimately reformed the Chinese Republic. 
Meanwhile, the communists continued to resist against nationalist encirclement campaigns, and in the north, the Mukden incident sparked a full-blown Japanese invasion of Manchuria, against which Chiang simply couldn't resist. Nonetheless, the Nanking decade was a time of consolidation for the nationalists. Thus, Chiang's regime would embark on a modernization effort, successfully improving its economy and renegotiating some of the foreign concessions, and also starting the training of loyal and elite divisions with the aid of German advisors. Eventually, the communists would be finally routed at Jiangxi in 1934, but the Red Army would manage to break through the Kuomintang encirclement, starting the Long March to the northwest. Led by Mao Zedong, the main column would successfully avoid the pursuit of Kuomintang forces and would march for an entire year through more than 9,000 kilometers until arriving at Shanxi, where Mao became the undisputed leader of the party. From their new base at Yan'an, the communists would continue to resist Chiang's attacks for the next few years. This period would also see increased Japanese aggression in the north, rapidly expanding their puppet states into the Chahar and Jeho provinces and threatening the important city of Beijing. But Chiang took a passive position against Japan and considered the communists to be a greater danger to the Chinese Republic, stating that communism was cancer while the Japanese only represented a superficial wound. This policy of compromise was very unpopular in China and within the Kuomintang itself, which prompted some disgruntled nationalist generals to conspire with the communists to capture Chiang and force him into a truce with the CCP. Meanwhile, the Sui Yuan campaign of Prince Demchuk Dongrup failed miserably and General Fu Yi managed to inflict heavy casualties on the Inner Mongolian army, alerting the conspirators that this was the time to act while morale was high against the Japanese. So on December 12, 1936, Chiang was detained in the Xi'an incident and had to negotiate with the communists for two weeks, finally deciding to cease hostilities against them to prepare for an impending war with Japan and to form a second united front against the Japanese. By 1937, the Chinese had assembled a large army of 1,700,000 regulars and 557,000 reservists in preparation for the war. But the loyalty of great sections of the army was questionable. It had a low supply of guns and artillery, and it only counted two armored units. Unlike China, the Japanese were prepared for total war, with the IJA counting 1,015,000 regulars destined to fight in China and around 78,000 soldiers from their puppet states. The 28 divisions assigned for the war were fully trained, equipped and experienced, giving them a clear advantage in fighting strength against the Chinese. During the year 1937, a series of border clashes occurred between Chinese and Japanese forces, usually ending with the Chinese writing a humiliating apology. But on July 7th, the Marco Polo Bridge incident to the west of Beijing would ignite a full-scale war between the two countries, as a fire exchange quickly escalated into the Japanese occupation of Tianjin and Beijing by August 8th. Tokyo was very happy with the outcome of the campaign, but it was reluctant to declare war on the Chinese, as the Japanese didn't want to divert forces from the Manchurian border with the Soviet Union, where several border conflicts had been happening in the last few years. But Chiang had had enough, and he consequently mobilized his entire forces to fight against Japan's aggression. The war had thus begun. Meanwhile, in Shanghai, fighting broke out between Chinese troops under Zhang Jijong and the 4,000-strong Japanese marines that defended 30,000 Japanese civilians. Tokyo quickly reinforced the Shanghai defenders with 20,000 more marines, commanded by General Matsui Iwane, and also ordered the 3rd Fleet to open fire on Chinese positions. Shanghai was of the utmost importance for Chiang's regime, so he sent his most loyal men to have numerical superiority in the struggle. Chinese air operations also managed to inflict severe damage over the 3rd Fleet with their advanced biplane and monoplane designs. The Battle of Shanghai was brutal, with heavy losses on each side 
but to no effect, as in the urban center, the fighting reached a stalemate. Furthermore, Japanese naval landings to the north forced the Chinese to disperse their forces along a front line that spanned from the Huangpu River to the coast north of Shanghai. At the same time, an expeditionary force of the Kwantung Army advanced southwards through Inner Mongolia, crushing the Chinese at the battles of Nanko, Huailai, and Kalgan with the superior firepower of their tanks. These forces would then advance to Shangxi, taking Taiwan and completing the conquest of Inner Mongolia by November 7th, while from Beijing, the Japanese would advance to occupy the North China Plain. On the seas, the IJN would also start a naval blockade all around China, hoping to prevent foreign aid from reaching the nation, as the Western powers strongly condemned the Japanese invasion. In September and October, as Matsui's forces managed to capture Luodian and Liu Hang, more Japanese reinforcements arrived that successfully wrestled control of the critical position at Dachang. With Dachang lost, the Chinese forces started to withdraw from Shanghai on November 7th, but the retreat quickly turned into a rout and Chang lost most of his loyal and elite men. Overall, the Chinese suffered more than 250,000 casualties in the struggle, while the Japanese only suffered around 90,000 casualties. Weakened by the defeat at Shanghai, disparate Chinese units established defenses around their capital, led by Commander Tang Shenji. At the same time, Matsui started a pincer movement directed towards Nanking, defeating the already battered Chinese soldiers and reaching the Chinese capital with haste by December 9th. What followed was a bloody struggle on the outskirts of Nanking, one in which superior Japanese firepower would win the day yet again, even despite the fierce resistance of Tang's men. As the Chinese defenses were collapsing and the Japanese encircled the city, Chiang ordered the abandonment of Nanking on December 11th, but only a small force led by Tang himself could break out of the Japanese encirclement on December 13th. The rest of the defenders, along with some 200,000 civilians, were slaughtered during the Nanking Massacre. The Nanking population was also subjected to rape, looting and arson by the Japanese soldiers in what the West came to describe as the Rape of Nanking. By the end of the year, Japanese successes thus far would allow them to establish collaborationist governments in Beijing, Shanghai and Nanking and to reform its Inner Mongolian puppet into the new Mengjiang government. At this point, Tokyo was expecting that the Chinese would capitulate after the fall of their capital as they were eager to end the war and further prepare for a confrontation with the Soviet Union. But Chiang would continue to reject the harsh demands of the invaders, thus moving the capital to the industrial center of Hankou. Moreover, the Japanese forces, encouraged by the many victories achieved, continued to escalate the war in China and tried to establish a connection between Beijing and Nanking. Already in the early months of 1938, naval landings in Tsingtao culminated with the occupation of northern Shandong by March, although the Japanese advance would be stopped for the first time in the Battle of Taiyuan. This was a huge morale booster for the Chinese, and as the leader of the battle was warlord Li Zongren, there would be much more unity among the warlord and Kuomintang forces after this battle. Nonetheless, the Japanese would manage to encircle the major crossroads of Suzhou, which protected the new capital at Hankou. Chiang recognized that the defense of the town was futile, so he ordered his forces to withdraw and to demolish the dikes holding back the Yellow River, trying to slow down the Japanese advance. The resulting Yellow River flood inflicted heavy casualties on the Japanese and forced them to move up the Yangtze River but it also caused incalculable destruction on the area and killed almost 500,000 civilians. Most of the Chinese soldiers, however, managed to retreat and establish solid defenses around Hankou. At the same time, the Japanese successfully invaded Amoy Island to prepare for more naval invasions and they also started bombing operations over Hankou and the Sichuan region. But the main objective of the Japanese advance 
was now the city of Hankou, and Tokyo finally destined most of their resources for this campaign. On June 15th, the battle for Hankou started with the Japanese naval invasion of Anqing, followed by a string of successful naval invasions along the coast, an attack along the southern shore of the Yangtze River, and a two-pronged assault through the Dabia Mountains. The success of these operations meant that, by October, the Chinese defences on the provinces of Henan, Jiangxi and Hubei were in a difficult position, leaving the way open to attack Hankou. Yet the Chinese would also succeed at stopping the Japanese advance through Wanjialing, and managed to mount a counterattack north of the Yangtze towards Taihu and Susong. But despite the fierce resistance of the Chinese, on October 21st, the Japanese naval invasion of Guangzhou ended in complete success, occupying the main port through which foreign aid was flowing and completing the encirclement of Hankou. With the fall of Guangzhou, the Chinese had no other alternative but to abandon their second capital on October 25th. But the four-month-long resistance had at least gained much time for Chang to prepare a new wartime capital at Chongqing and to prepare his forces to wage a war of attrition against the Japanese. Yet again, Tokyo hoped to end the war with the fall of Hankou, but to no avail, as the Chinese were determined to continue their resistance. Moreover, the Japanese forces had suffered many losses during the Hankou campaign and were very exhausted as well. In the last months of the year, the Japanese would continue to consolidate their control over the Wuhan and Canton regions, but they could already see that the war would be more prolonged than they had anticipated. Next week, we'll cover the continuation of the Sino-Japanese War, as well as the outbreak of hostilities in Europe and its impact in the Pacific. So make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see the next video in the series. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.